Hey, Southwinds family, I'm Chris, your children's pastor. I want to welcome you to this week of Southwinds Online. I'm here in our new set for Southwinds Kids TV, Kids Corner. And today we're kicking off filming our children's lessons from this spot and making it like a kids TV show. Trust me, there'll be plenty of silliness and lots of learning about God together for your kids. So make sure you check it out on our Southwinds Children's Ministry YouTube channel. You can subscribe if you haven't already. Today, August 30th at 8 a.m., we're launching our first outdoor worship service out in the courtyard. And we'll be socially distancing and everyone needs to bring their own chairs, masks are encouraged. We can't wait to see those of you who are ready to gather outdoors. And for those who are not yet ready to gather, we can, we'll continue to provide online services just like this, just like we have for the last five months. You'll need our new Southwinds app for our outdoor service. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, just text Southwinds app to 33777. And on the app, you'll be able to watch our services, take message notes, get the latest announcements, or ask for some prayer. And during this season of lockdowns and social distancing, so many of us have found our life groups to be lifelines. We've launched our fall life groups enrollment, and we'd love to have you get connected. In fact, that's what we're doing. We're asking the question, are you connected? So go to southwinds.org slash life group, or again, you can text Southwinds to 33777. If you're interested in receiving a life groups catalog by email, email lifegroups at southwinds.org. Southwinds Celebrate Recovery's first CR on the patio happens this Friday, September 4th at 7 p.m. Check out our Southwinds Celebrate Recovery page for more info or email cr at southwinds.org with any questions. Throughout this season, we've been seeking ways to serve our communities. We've just held our fourth Red Cross blood drive this week, and we'll be sponsoring two more days, September 28th and 29th. And you can sign up for that at www.redcrossblood.org, and the sponsor code is Southwinds. Each week, we want to say a big thank you to those who continue to faithfully and sacrificially give to help us carry out our mission of sharing Christ's love with our neighbors. As we come out of these summer months, your generosity matters more than ever. You can give online at southwinds.org slash giving. Or if you want to give from your phone, there it is again. Just text Southwinds to 33777, where you can give one time or set up a recurring gift. Well, we can't wait to see you if you're joining us outdoors in person today. And we can't wait to see every one of you really soon.
Hey, Southwinds, welcome to our online study of God's Word today. I am so looking forward to seeing a number of you at our first outdoor service, but I'm also so glad to be studying God's Word with you who are here virtually. Next Sunday, I'm going to be starting a brand new series called Hope for Exiles. And this fall, we're going to together be walking through the letter of 1 Peter. And I cannot think of a more timely study. 1 Peter was written to Christ followers living in hard times. Peter said they were going through fiery trials. They faced persecution, the loss of their work, social ostracism, poverty. People were attacking them for their beliefs. Some of them were being killed. Because they followed Christ, they didn't belong. They were different. And Peter calls them exiles, outsiders, We're going to be asking together, how do we love God in a culture like ours that increasingly sees us as outsiders? How do we serve our neighbors when they reject our convictions? How do we share the gospel and how do we share Christ's love? I hope this week you'll start reading through and praying over 1 Peter. As I was thinking about this hope that Peter teaches us studying this letter, my mind went to another passage about hope. This week I was led to Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, which is a classic teaching on how to live in a time like ours. Paul is writing about hope, and I'm guessing that a number of you may not be feeling very hopeful today. Is there anyone else who would be very glad when 2020 is finally over? From political polarization that only deepens to a pandemic that just goes on and on and on, from racial injustice and division to protests that sometimes turn into violent riots. And and then for us in our area, fire burning out of control. I mean, is there anyone else who's keeping a close eye out for the murder hornets? It would be really easy to feel hopeless. And we're reminded in a time like this how much we need hope. There are few things in life more important than hope. Neuroscientist Tali Sherratt said in a 2012 TED Talk that hope is so essential to our survival, it's just hardwired into our brains. Studies show that hopeful college students have higher GPAs, that hopeful athletes perform better and they recover from injury more quickly. Hopeful patients get well far faster than patients who just give up. One study of elderly Uh, People showed that those who felt hopeless were more than twice as likely to die as those who remained hopeful. That's why Dr. Shane Lopez, a psychologist widely regarded as the world's leading researcher on hope, once said that hope isn't just an emotion. It's an essential tool for life. And when I hear that, I'm reminded of Proverbs 13, 12. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred. 
I'm hoping for something and it keeps getting put off and keeps getting put off to the point that your heart becomes sick. Wouldn't you say that we're kind of living in that now, that there's this sense of hope deferred? I mean, I feel it and many of you have told me you feel it. The truth is we cannot live without hope. I think there are a lot of heart sick people right now. And that's why building resilient hope is so utterly crucial for us. That's why we need Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Now, as we begin, I want to be clear on what hope is. Hope is not just wishful thinking, like like I'm hoping for something. I walk a lot along Sycamore Parkway near where I live, and not too long ago, someone has tied some cards and pins to a tree so people can write their wishes and hang them there in the tree. Maybe you've seen the story in the Tracy Press. And, and one of them just wishes for everything to, to go back to normal. And, you know, I wish for that too. But that's not what resilient hope is about. It's not just wishful thinking. Resilient hope is also not just optimism. And optimism is a good thing. Optimism is this positive outlook on life. We, we look for the good, not for the bad. It's good to be optimistic, but that's not hope. Resilient hope, the kind of hope the Bible talks about, is something far greater, far deeper. Let me give you a definition. Resilient hope is confident, active expectation based on the certainty of what God has said and what Christ has done. Just think about that definition. Resilient hope is confident, active expectation. Its confidence is based on God and and it's active, not passive. It's an expectation. I'm actually leaning into it. And then here's what it's based on. It is based on the certainty of what God has said and what Christ has done. As we see in Romans 5, hope is always connected to faith. It's it's hard to have certainty on something that was said a long time ago or on what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago. And that's why the Bible always ties faith and hope together. You see, faith is based on what God has done. But hope looks forward to what God will do. My faith is grounded in what God has said in his word and how his word has been proven reliable and true. It's grounded in what Christ has done on the cross, what he did in human history. My faith looks back on that. And then based on that, my hope looks forward to what God will do, knowing that I can trust him. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Paul shows us in these verses how faith and hope connect. And he shows us how we can develop a resilient hope. Let me begin in verses 1 and 2, where we are shown four results of faith in Christ. Let's read those two verses together. You follow along in your copy of God's word. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So here's the first result of faith in Christ. I'm made right with God. Paul says we have been justified by faith. That word justified simply means that God has declared us right. He has forgiven our sins. God is the judge, and he has pronounced the sentence of guilty over us. But instead of giving us the judgment we deserve, he gives us righteousness based on Christ. And that's a forgiveness, not only of my sins past, not only of my sins present, but also my sins future. And this means I don't have to live in fear that I'm going to do some sin down the line that makes me wrong with God. In Christ, I've been forgiven for all eternity. Second, he says, I have peace with God. And whether you realize it or not, if you don't have a relationship with God through Christ, Scripture says that you are God's enemy. There's a hostility between you and God. And and as a result, you can never have true peace at a soul level. But the moment you put your faith in Christ, from that moment forward, you always have peace peace with God. There's no division anymore, and you can know peace in your heart. I want to say this directly to some of you. You've never trusted in Jesus and been made right with God, so you don't have true peace. 
and circumstances in your life cause you even more anxiety. And you think that it's just need, you just need to change your circumstances and that will bring you true peace. But it's only a relationship with God that brings that kind of peace. It's an incredible thing. I'm just telling you to be able to get up every morning and know that today, no matter what happens, I have peace with God. To be able to put your head on your pillow at night and and no matter what is going on in this world, to know I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Not only that, but look what he says next. Third, he says, I live in grace. He uses this phrase, this grace in which we stand. This grace in which we do everyday life. God doesn't give me what I deserve because every day I deserve judgment. I deserve condemnation. I mess up so many times and yet in grace, God doesn't give me what I deserve. He gives me what I don't deserve, which is love and forgiveness. He he gives me the ability, and I love this, this phrase, this grace in which we stand. He gives me the ability to stand in Christ, to, to make the right choices. That by grace today, he is saving me. That that grace wasn't just in the moment I trusted in Christ and was saved, but by grace, it wasn't just that day. It's every day since then. And then there's the final result of faith in Christ. And this is where we come to hope. He says, we hope. And, And I love this phrasing. We don't just have any hope. This is resilient hope because I can actually hope in the glory of God. Now, what's the glory of God? I think many of us struggle with understanding this, but, but think of it this way. Glory is God's power, God's beauty. It's God's majesty and it's God's holiness. It, it's all the characteristics of God brought together. And God is so incredible and so awesome. The glory of God. In 1 Timothy 6, 16 God is described as unapproachable light. He's this blazing glory that if we saw him in all his glory and if we saw all of who he is, we couldn't even get near him. We've only had glimpses of it. Maybe you remember the story in the Gospels one time where Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a high mountain. Mark 9 describes that there was this transfiguration and Mark says that Jesus' clothes started becoming bright and Light. It was like his glory starts leaking out. Moses and Elijah join Jesus. And the disciples are overwhelmed. And we're told that Peter just starts talking. He doesn't know exactly what's going on. So he doesn't know exactly what to say. But as he's realizing he's seeing the glory of God, it reminds him of the tabernacle. And maybe you remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament was built to house God's glory when the spirit of God would come down. And so Peter says, we got to make some tents. We need one for Jesus. We need one for Moses. We need one for Elijah. Mark writes, he didn't know what to say. He just was babbling because he was so overwhelmed, so terrified. See, we've never seen the full glory of God. We get glimpses of it with creation. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I don't know if you've had that moment maybe where you stand on a seashore and the sun is setting, you see the vast ocean and something in your soul wells up. It's because you're getting glimpses of glory. Or maybe for you it's happened when you go through the tunnel at Yosemite and you see that magnificent valley spread out before you and your heart leaps. Or maybe you've traveled to Big Sur and you see McWay Falls after a winter rain. Or maybe you've experienced this when you've seen a newborn's face. The heavens and the earth declare the glory of God, but that's only a glimpse. Can you imagine if you saw it in full glory? About 10 years ago, astronomers at the University of Sheffield discovered what is now the brightest star that we've ever found. They they named this star R136A1. This star is 265 times larger than our sun. 
But that's not the most amazing part. This star is 10 million times brighter than our sun. I mean, just try to imagine how, how powerful and how bright that is. You know, if you've ever been outside, maybe up in the mountains or maybe out in the desert on a dark night, far away from the lights of civilization, and maybe, maybe you've seen the Milky Way blazing in the glory that God gave it. And in that moment, you have this sense of the glory of God. But think about this. That's just you seeing like 5,000 or so stars that are visible to the naked eye. The glory of God. The glory of God is what we hope for. But notice what Paul is saying. We don't hope for it as this glory that we have to be frightened by. We, We don't hope for it as this unapproachable glory. It's interesting If we went into God's presence right now, just as we are, it would be a horrible thing because when you're before him in all his glory and you're sinful, you cry out in horror. But I love how 1 John 3 puts it. One day when we appear before him, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fall down. We can see him, look at him face to face. Why? John says, because we'll be like him. He's gonna change us completely. Our salvation in that day will be so complete that instead of being frightened by the glory of God, we can enjoy it. I don't know if you've ever daydreamed about heaven and about all the abilities that we might have in heaven, things you would love to be able to do. I mean, I'd love to play basketball like Michael Jordan. I'd love to hit a baseball as far as Tiger Woods drives a golf ball. I would love to fly. I mean, wouldn't you? Have you ever just daydreamed about all those things we might be able to do? But think about this. The greatest ability you're going to have in heaven is to be able to be in the presence of God and just enjoy it because you'll be so changed to be like him that you can experience him in his fullness. And that's our hope. That's what we hope for. And as you see that, you're seeing that faith and hope go hand in hand. But I can read a passage like this and I can think about the hope of glory and it may seem so wonderful away, away out there. But how do I have resilient hope now? How do I develop a resilient hope in my day-to-day life? And that's where Paul is taking us in the next verses, Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. He's going to tell us four steps to develop a resilient hope. I want you to listen to these verses. Paul writes, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And then I love this line, and hope does not put us to shame. It's not the kind of hope you'll ever be embarrassed about. It's it's not the kind of hope you'll look back and, and go, ugh, why did I hope in that? Why is that true? Well, Paul says, because God's Love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, keeping verses one and two as our foundation, I want you to to see this process that God has for developing resilient hope. There's this foundation that has to start with faith in Christ, as we've said. That's verses one and two. And again, let me say, if you don't have faith in Christ, if you don't have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then everything I'm teaching you won't help. Because you can't work yourself into this kind of hope by trying real hard. This hope is only available in Christ. And so again, I want to encourage you, if you've not taken that faith step, Reach out today. Connect with someone. You can email me. I would love to talk with you in person. And maybe you have questions about that and maybe you don't know how to do that, but you're never going to have what we're talking about apart from faith in Christ. So keep that in mind. And now with with that faith foundation in Christ in mind, look at this first step. How do I develop resilient hope? He says, and the first step is, I rejoice in suffering. And can we be honest with each other? I mean, this is not where we want to begin, right? I'll be honest with you. I don't like this. I want to go straight from faith in Christ immediately to hope. 
And if I have enough hope, I'm going to get there, I think, and I'm going to experience the love of God and know his glory. It's like, boom, done. But Paul says it actually doesn't work that way. Life is hard. And the Bible is frank and open and honest about that. I love Jesus' honesty. This is what Jesus says in John 16, 33. You remember these verses, these words. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. In other words, don't give up hope. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. See, you are going to face suffering. You are going to face persecution. You are going to face disease. You're going to face unemployment. You're going to face a pandemic because we face suffering. And Paul says in that moment, you have that choice to rejoice in your suffering. In the letter of James, Jesus' brother James puts it this way. He says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. It's a choice. But notice what it doesn't say. Paul doesn't say it. James doesn't say it. It doesn't say you have to smile and laugh and joke all the time you're suffering. That's denial. The Bible never tells us to rejoice because of suffering. Paul doesn't say rejoice because of suffering. Did you notice? He says we rejoice in our sufferings. There's a big difference. I am choosing to rejoice even though I'm in suffering. So how can I make that choice? Well, look at the text again. Paul tells us, he he tells us we can rejoice because rejoicing in suffering leads to something valuable. And that's the second step to develop resilient hope. Second, I allow suffering to produce endurance. You see, when I rejoice in suffering, it produces endurance. Can we talk? Can we be honest with each other? We we have it so easy in this country. And honestly, that's part of the reason why 2020 is so hard for so many of us. You know, there's a lot of people around the world who would look at us right now and say to us, you know, your 2020 is like our 21st century. It's just the way life is for them. And it has been as long as they can remember. And a lot of Christ followers have bought into a false theology that teaches if you just love God enough and serve God enough, God will make your life comfortable. But the Bible never teaches that. Paul actually says no. And you're going to discover when we study First Peter that Peter says no, that suffering is part of the Christian life. In fact, Jesus himself told us that if Jesus, our Lord and Master, suffered, why would we as servants of his expect to escape? And we don't like this, but we know this. We know that the hard times in life can bring good things in us. And Paul says here that suffering produces endurance, resilience, perseverance. It works the same way with our physical bodies. Bob Record wrote about when he decided that he needed to get in shape. And so he started working out and he was doing weights and cardio. And it seemed as he did this for months and months and months, nothing was happening. It was just hard work. Nothing was really changing in his body. And that's the way it was until one day it all changed. I want you to listen to how he describes it. He said it was like this quantum leap. He said, weight began to drop off. Muscle began to get toned. Endurance increased. Medical friends told me that the constancy of working out, regardless of how I felt, because of that, a whole new freeway system of small blood vessels and capillaries were forming in my body. And then came the day when they decided it was time for a grand opening. And suddenly more blood came flooding into the muscle tissue. And the resultant benefits seemed exponential. In other words, it didn't feel like it, but his body was changing and growing. And God does the same thing in our lives spiritually when we rejoice in suffering. He grows us and he produces endurance. He takes us through those hard times. And as we endure, we develop the kind of endurance and resilience that that suddenly, it seems, brings growth. And out of that, we are able to keep going, keep going for the long haul. I think spiritually that we, we like being like cheetahs. You ever watch a cheetah run? 
A cheetah can run 70 miles an hour, incredibly fast. But the cheetah's weakness is that its body is so sleek, it's built for speed, that its heart is small. And so while it is explosive and it can explode up to 70 miles an hour, it can't run for very long. And a lot of Christians have trained themselves to be like cheetahs. You know, we love to rise in the moment. We love to hit it hard. We love to go and immediately conquer and immediately overcome. And then we want it over with. But life just doesn't work that way. And if you've trained yourself like that, it's pretty easy to lose hope pretty quick. Because life's suffering often goes on and on and on. And I think it's part of what many of us are struggling with in this pandemic. We just wanted to hit it like cheetahs. We were going to face it and we were going to learn from it and we were going to overcome it and we were going to be done. But then it keeps going and going and going and we have to decide, are we going to allow God to do his good work of endurance? And there's good news out of that, Paul says. This third step to developing resilient hope is this. You can write this down. Paul says, as I endure, God changes my character. As I endure and get stronger, God starts doing something in us. And the reason you can rejoice and endure in suffering, it's not necessarily that my circumstances have changed, but it's that I'm changing. I'm becoming more like Christ. I'm growing in my ability to love others better. I start displaying the fruit of the Spirit more and more. God is using everything in my life, life's sufferings, life's frustrations, even my failures. He's using those to build resilient hope. In 2014, Naval Admiral William McRaven gave the commencement address at the University of Texas. It's a great speech. It's, it has over 3.2 million views on YouTube. And, and he had 10 points. I want to just share one of them with you. One of, his, one of his points was this. He said, don't be afraid of the circus. Here's what he meant. He's a former Navy SEAL. And he said, when you're in Navy SEAL training, you have these performance goals every day. You have to do calisthenics and swimming and and running. And if you don't meet that day's goals, you get assigned to the circus. And the circus was an extra two hours of calisthenics and training at the end of the day. It was designed to break you down, to weed you out. He said in the speech, he said that everyone had to face the circus at one time or another. And it was interesting. Uh, Some people who had to go through it the most were the very ones who got stronger and stronger. It, It was like their failure actually led to stronger bodies and stronger character. Listen to his closing words. He says, life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times it will test you to your core. But if you want to change the world... Don't be afraid of the circus. You see, when God has called you to a time of suffering, don't be afraid when you're having to endure longer than you thought it would be. Don't be afraid because he is changing your character. He is making you more and more like his son, Jesus. And out of that, you know what comes next? Well, here's where we finally discover we develop resilient hope. And you see, Again, hope doesn't happen instantaneously. Hope must be developed. This is the resilient hope development process. And I want you to know, I don't say this glibly or lightly. I know that some of you are enduring some very hard things. I know that some of you are in a time of desperately difficult suffering. You're having to endure it in your marriage and it's really hard. You're having to endure being alone and it's really hard. You're having to endure a health crisis. You're having to endure an economic crisis and you don't know how much longer you can go on. And I want you to hear me. I don't wish your suffering on anyone But the hope is that God is taking that suffering and using that suffering. And as we embrace that reality, we do grow. And our hope gets stronger. Our our hope becomes more and more resilient. And God gets glory. The author Philip Yancey talks about a letter he received from a friend of his. She had a daughter named Peggy who was terminally ill with cancer, and she was about to die. 
And her last weekend before she went into the hospital for the last time, she went to church. And it was like she was going to church one last time. And she came home so very excited. And she told her mother, she said, the minister today gave me a definition of endurance from William Barclay. And William Barclay was a a biblical scholar in the last century. She was so excited that she wrote this on a three by five index card. And, And here's what the minister said. He said, endurance is not just the ability to bear a hard thing but to turn it into glory. Endurance is not just the ability to bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory, to embrace that process of all that God is doing. And when Peggy told her mom, she said, you know, here's what really stood out to me. After he read that phrase, the minister pounded the pulpit once, and then he turned around and he started crying. Because evidently he was having to endure something difficult in his life. I just want to say to you today, tears are not a sign you don't have hope. A lot of hopeful people also cry a lot because suffering is real. And because they're enduring and they know that God is forging them in that. But it's still a painful process. But in that process, we have a hope of glory. And I love how how Paul caps this whole thing, this whole process, our our faith and hope that grows. The last part he says is, is it's a hope that doesn't put us to shame. Why? Paul says it's because the love of God is the, the umbrella over all of it. Because if God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us while we were still sinners... Can't we trust him now in this process of life? And so as we close, I want you to see that like every step in this process of developing resilient hope, there's a decision that you have to make. And maybe you are at one of these junctures today. And so at the foundation of all of this, as I've been saying, you've got to have faith in Christ. So there's a decision. Do you have faith in Christ? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Because if you don't, you don't have this foundation. You're never going to have this hope. And so you have to take this faith step. And I want to challenge you. And I want to encourage you to take this step today. But if you are in Christ and you have that faith, maybe today you're facing suffering. And if that's true, here's the choice you have to make. Are you going to resent it or rejoice? Do you spend every day resenting that God has brought suffering in your life or do you rejoice? Not because of it, but you're rejoicing in it because God is there with you in it. And then out of that, maybe you're in a time of endurance and and here's your, your choice with endurance. Are you living every day discouraged or determined? Are you allowing this ongoing pandemic to just get you down, just discourage you, And you just choose to live in that. Or do you look at it and do you say, I am determined that God is doing something in my life, that God is doing this, and so I'm going to trust him. And then you come to this this place of character. And and here's the choice that Romans 12 tells us about, that, that every day you're being shaped one way or another. The question here is, is your character being conformed or transformed? Is it being shaped by the world or transformed by God? Are you allowing everything on the outside to shape you? Or are you allowing God inside you to transform you inside out? And then, then when you come to that final thick of hope, I'll ask you again. Is your hope resilient? Is your hope, like here sometimes, absent other times, Is your hope weak? Is your hope strong? You see, Jesus Christ died and Jesus Christ rose again to give us resilient hope. It's what the Christian life is about. It's what God calls us to. And friends, it is what the world desperately needs to see right now. The people around you, they need to see Christ followers with resilient hope. A church filled with people with resilient hope. I mean, they need people who are realistic 
And we may have tears with that hope. We may face hard times with that hope. But because we know what God is doing in the process, we are people of resilient hope. Maybe you know this verse that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. He says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You ever wonder why does Paul say that? See, the reality is that someday, someday, we're not going to need faith and hope anymore. One day I won't need faith in Christ. It won't be faith. It will be sight. I will get to see him. And one day I won't hope for glory. I will be in his glory. I will get to experience his glory forever and ever. But Paul is saying on that day, what's going to abide forever? What's going to remain forever? And he says, it's the love of God. And friends, I know this is true and I trust him in that. And so I don't just wait for that day that I know one day is coming. Today, I have a bold, resilient hope because of what God has said and because of what Christ has done. I I pray, I pray that that is true for you and that it's true today. Would you join me as we bow our heads and we pray together? Father, we we thank you. We thank you for your word. We we thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. We we thank you for his salvation. And Lord, I I thank you for a, a passage like this that's so clear. And Lord, honestly, we know this is not the process we would choose, but we, we see and we recognize it's the one you've designed. And so, Lord, I, I pray that I would embrace it well, that it, at each of these junctures, I would trust you. I pray that my faith would be in you, and I pray these things would be true for those who are listening to me. Lord, I pray that when I come to that place of suffering, I won't resent it, but rejoice in it. And Lord, I pray that when I need to endure, I, I won't get discouraged, but, but more determined because I know what you are doing. And Lord, when I see you changing my character, Lord, I want to be transformed, not conformed. And Lord, I just, I thank you that we can have hope. And so, Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for everyone who is listening that you would build and develop in us resilient hope. Lord, I pray that for everyone listening, that we would know that these things are true and that we would trust you in all these things and that we would live, Lord, in a a way that our our neighbors, the, the world around us, the culture around us, that they could all see your beauty, your glory today. Lord, all these things now, all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, the good and the strong and the beautiful name of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord. And all God's people together say, amen, amen. I want us to end our time together today with this wonderful, beautiful benediction. It's in Romans 15, 13, and it's all about resilient hope. Would you read it out loud? It's gonna be on the screen. Just read it out loud with me there, wherever you are. Here's what Paul writes. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. May God richly bless you all. I'll see you next week.